So for the past few months, I've been working on a, a problem that I've just found extremely difficult and haven't come up with a solution to. And yet it seems that we are being so overtaken by catastrophic historical events right now um, that I just want to go ahead and um, outline what may be a possible analytic framework for trying to make sense of it, um, even although I feel really uncomfortable about this. Um, and the question, one of the form of the question, because there's, there's so many formulations of this question in my mind at the moment, but one form is how can we describe reality without traumatizing people? Um, and specifically, how can we do that when there's an urgency, when failing to describe that reality will actively contribute to the catastrophic social suffering of people? Okay. And the example of that is in the title of this talk, in the traumatic construction of the post-Holocaust genocide, in the word genocide. Because for some people, that word is already a triggering word. That, that is a word that already triggers um, uh, traumatic responses. Um, so how could we describe a situation that in terms of um, legal scholarship and international law is in the space of historical genocide um, if referring to it using that language uh, not only is, is it served to be triggering for certain groups of people, but in fact renders the interventions that might bring that violence to an end, um, uh, renders that more difficult, that the reactions to the, to the triggering nature of the language means that, that certain conversations have to not happen. Certain issues need to be kept off the table. And so the space for even working to a, to a historical moment beyond mass violence um, is obstructed. Um, a quote from Mahmoud Mamdani's book on the Rwandan genocide, I think has really been on my mind in developing this conceptual framework. Mamdani says atrocity cannot be its own explanation. And that's really what this is about. Violence cannot be allowed to speak for itself, for violence is not its own meaning. To be made thinkable, it needs to be historic, historicized. Um, and so this work that I'm trying to do now is the work of contextualizing atrocity and saying, uh, le instead of letting atrocity speak for itself, how can we make sense of it uh, and unpack its meanings? Um, and I want to unpack its meanings in, an, in a number of different ways. But the main theoretical framework I'm trying to articulate today is, is the one that offers a need to identify both the emotional and conceptual elements of the experience of violence and how these contribute to the lived experience. Um, and I think it's important because often we just think about the uh, conceptual side of it. Okay, so firstly, emotional, that that the underlying uh, emotional residence, resonance, or in some instance, the underlying um, tra traumatic experience that is invoked by a particular kind of violence shapes how it is felt, how it is, how it is lived, how it is embodied in the world. At the same time, the experience of, of, of particular incidents or, or, or categories of violence is also lived through the ideas, the frameworks, the narratives, the the that that make it intelligible. So there's also a kind of a an, a shared intellectual system that makes those um, experiences of violence intelligible. Finally, the important thing to realize that that this is that these emotions and ideas coalesce socially. And social groups and people within those groups then then live these ideas and emotions um, as as their experience of 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 particular incidents of violence. Now, my focus today is not on just the experience of violence, but the, the contestation of opposing interpretations of the experience of violence. And one of the interesting things is certainly within academia, 
that contestation usually happens at the level of ideas. It happens at the level of claims. It happens at the level of of, of disputing facts, uh, disputing interpretation. But it seems to me that the motivation for that contestation happens at the level of emotion. And so there's this kind of double process happening. There's a kind of an underlying emotional process which keeps on sort of, you know, exploding into the interactions, which is driving another kind of process, which is the, um, the, the intellectual di disputation. Um, and I think we need to look at the interaction between those two much more closely. Um, another thing I want us to point to is the way in which just even the contestation of ideas can be experienced as forms of violence. It can be experienced as attacks on the self or attacks on a, on a social group. Um, and I think this is a serious and under, underrated issue, which I want to try and elaborate a little bit. And the other thing um, which is very, very important is that those ideas and emotions can lead to acts of violence. They, 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 can, they, they can become the basis for individual or collective acts of mass violence, including massive uh, acts of historical violence, war, genocide. All of these can be traced back to the um, uh, their relationship to ideas and emotions linked to particular historical circumstances. Okay, so what is the context of this work? Um, and part of what I'm focusing on is this question of division, this, this question of polarization, this question of antagonism. And I'm, and I'm identifying from the outset of some quite interesting uh, divides that are happening at the moment. So the context is eight months of 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 absolutely irreconcilable irre representations of the war slash genocide slash ethnic cleansing of Gaza. Okay, and what's interesting is that even those different words um, are indicative of those divides of who of like is it appropriately named a war? Is it appropriately named a genocide? Um, what 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 kind of intelligibility are we attributing to? the the tens of thousands of deaths that we are seeing happen. This is in itself located in a long-standing problem that that certainly in the West has been referred to as the intractability of conflict in the Middle East. This idea that well that some things are just so difficult to understand and to fix that they just we just don't know what to do about them. And one of these is 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 the problem of the so-called Middle East, which is really um, the problem of um, of, this, of the state of Israel and um, Gaza. Um, so what we're seeing right at the moment is this this massive and growing split between supporters of Gaza Palestinians and supporters of the Zionist project. And what I'm interested to do is to see if it's possible to intervene in the split in a way that is informed by the idea of uh, future-oriented violence prevention, um, or whether, in fact, this is not possible at all. Now, when we look at the, 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 the divisions that are emerging right in the moment, there's some interesting things going on. There's a younger generation, older generation split in the West. Um, certainly, older folks in the West seem to have historically been very sympathetic to the um, perspective of the state of Israel uh, on this, whereas what we're seeing is an emergent younger generation who are much more sympathetic to the uh, Palestinian cause. Um, there's also a long-standing division between the West and the rest of the world, uh, specifically the, re the rest of the world, meaning the colonized world. Um, and the Western perspective uh, once again, the more sympathetic perspective to the um, the, the politics and, and actions of the state of Israel versus the rest of the world's um, greater sympathy for the people of Palestine. And this is seen very clearly in the current case that is unfolding at the in, uh, International Court of Justice, the way in which the, 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 the support for the um, the genocide uh, accusation is primarily coming from uh, 
outside the West from historically colonized people, whereas the perspective of the West is has been um, the real basis of the um, the refutation of the allegation of genocide. Um, in some contexts, it's really specific. A lot of this fight is actually a fight in the United States, a division within um, the the U.S. as a society that is in some ways very, very invested uh, in the state of Israel uh, and invested in interesting ways, um, in ideological ways, but also in military and imperialist um, and economic ways. Um, within within with, with Within the West, it's it's interesting to see a, uh, a a kind of political split between right wing and left wing. It's not as simple as that, um, because there's this kind of third element. Um, but with, with uh, the, 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 what what's interesting to note is on the the sort of um, the, the right wing pro Zionist side, there's it, it turns out that there's a massive support from evangelical Christians, and in fact there are more fundamentalist evangelical Christian Zionists, and there are Jewish Zionists, many, many times more, that this is actually the primary ideological base, which is interesting, and it relates to a particular um, uh, theology, uh, a, a particular um, uh, theology around the, the, the rise and, 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 and catastrophic falling apart of the state of Israel as being a condition of possibility of the return of the Messiah. Um, but within kind of more progressive political circles, there's also division, um, uh, and, uh, anti-Zionist uh, and uh, pro-Zionist um, uh, divisions amongst people who are perhaps much more allied on, 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 on all other issues, but split on this one. And we can see this even within the Jewish community, that, that, that long before the formation of the State of Israel, when the, the very idea of Zionism was being uh, developed, um, there was a split between Jewish Zionists, Jewish anti-Zionists, and that split in itself is complex. It's the both um, ultra-Orthodox religious and also socially progressive um, for Jewish people. But this other category, an uh, interesting category of the PEP, the progressive except on Palestine. The person who has a general human rights oriented social philosophy, except for the single case of the human rights of Palestinian people. And this seems to be a really interesting figure, the, the, the figure of the PEP who supports human rights struggles in all instances, except in the case of the human rights of Palestinians. Um, What's been happening in, in the immediate last few weeks is the sudden emergence of anti-genocide encampments on university uh, around the world. It's, it started in the United States, a very well publicized incidents at Columbia University, um, uh, which re resulted in, in significant oppositional violence. The encampments themselves have not been violent, but the, the, the institutional response, the police response, and the response by Zionist um, agitators has, has um, on several occasions, been extremely violent. But, but there, it seems there's a shift in mood. And the shift in mood is from the idea that those who are concerned about the unfolding events in Gaza are no longer satisfied just to articulate their intellectual positions, they no longer believe that that simply engaging in ordinary social protest um, demonstration marches um, that that is that 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 has not been effective. That the 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 mass killing continues every single day in spite of that. Um, and so there was a sense of well, the, the people need to actually occupy and transform physical space in a in a in a, a symbolically disruptive way. Um, What's interesting is not just that that has happened, but the way in which university administrations have reacted to it. And one of the ways in which they've reacted to it is being particularly interesting to me and goes to the heart of what I want to discuss today. Um, on the one hand, universities are purportedly committed to academic freedom, to precisely the defense of different positions, the articulation of various um, intellectual and ethical positions. Um, and so generally they would want to claim to be on the side of, of the expression of multiple positions. But 
but they've had a specific uh, repetitive um, counter um, position to the encampments, which is the idea that they make some students feel unsafe. This idea of making some people feel unsafe, specifically making Zionists feel unsafe, seems to be a really, really interesting one. And it already come, had come out before the encampment. Uh, academics in, in, in some places have been advised not to cover the um, the Palestinian situation um, in, in, in their courses and in their public statements. Um, uh, an example of a Zoom meeting where a student using the little watermelon emoji was asked not to do that because just the presence of that image uh, was interpreted as being so potentially distressing to other students that it would interfere with the teaching and learning process. And this is really interesting. The point at which um, the the a, a symbol... Um, indicating a sympathy for people who are going through a catastrophic process of annihilation that has, has run into tens of thousands of deaths and is now in the cusp of shifting from tens of thousands of deaths from bombing to hundreds of thousands of deaths from uh, humanitarian collapse to the point where the blockade uh, and the destruction of hospitals and food supplies is now so significant that um, that death that, that death is transitioning into an endemic process where where mass starvation, mass death from infectious disease um, are now emerging as the norm, and so a, an, an apocalyptic scenario of human suffering is unfolding. In the face of this, it would seem interesting to say, is it? Is it really appropriate to be balancing the feelings of uh, some students um, who, who might feel uneasy with certain political expression with a world historical humanitarian catastrophe and arguably a full-blown genocide that is taking place? It seems uh, on the surface of it that there's an imbalance there. And it seems that that the reflex is to to discount that feeling of unsafety, um, and there are many good reasons to do so. Uh, certainly, one of the reasons is that, that that claim of unsafety is being weaponized. It's being used as a political tool to advance a particular uh, ethno-nationalist agenda, rather than being an expression of the actual lived emotional difficulties as, 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 of, of people. But I'm going to suspend that critique for a moment and say, let, what if we take at face value this feeling of, of unsafety and try and make sense of it? At the same time, there's another terrible feeling of unsafety that is, that is, that is not being addressed by, by the universities. Um, and this is the... the, the uh, vicarious traumatic impact of exposure to the news, to the images on social media, to the information that the scale of human atrocity is unfolding on our watch and what it means to exist in the knowledge of that, in the, in the conceptual presence of that. If you've never seen a person take the last breath, it's not like in the movies where they go like, or they just you know, they just stop. It's not like that. It's more like... <sighs> and do you know how I know that? Because I have been watching Palestinians take the last breath for the last couple of months. If you're not kind of messed up or you seek out those kind of things, you should not have seen a child take the last breath on a video like that. But I have forced myself to look at this video coming out of Gaza because it's important to know. And all those children I have also not died in the safety of their moms and dads' arms. They have died on cold floors in dirty hospitals because there are no functioning hospitals as of now. Um, and what it means for that to be being kind of ignored in a certain way, that there's a, there's a, there's a kind of a a, a real failure from universities who are generally um, seen as um, intellectually and ethically engaged projects 
to um, to to live up to the historical moment. So we've got this debate. Should the feelings of those people who are in one or another way linked to acts of of violence be taken seriously when when in 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 as a matter of material fact many other people's lives are at at, at immediate risk? Is is this an appropriate thing to do? And the answer that 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 seems intuitive that many people give is no, that's preposterous. And and in a strange way, what I want to do is push back against that and to say feelings are important, not in the sense that they should be taken at face value, but in the sense that they sh they they should be understood if we are going to intervene in um, the lives of people. Um, so. What is what are what is the basis of these feelings and what is going on with them? Here we get to the heart of my argument about we need to understand the emotions and the constructions of meaning of of experiences of violence. And to understand um, the one of the emotional experiences in this debate, we really have to understand Holocaust trauma. And I'm actually a little bit worried at the moment that this is this is something that is that is seems to be receding in the Western imagination for certainly for older generations. The 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 idea of the Holocaust was was really formative of their sense of what a historical ca catastrophe even is. It fundamentally defined um, the sense of what a genocide could even be. And functioned as this kind of moment of crisis for the West, the moment of like um, the West really worrying about itself in a particular way and its and its capacity for, for violence. But within that, there's also a a very very specific intergenerational trauma for people who were targeted as victims of the Holocaust. And there were multiple groups that were targeted, disabled people, Slavic people, um, um, Roma people. But the, the, specifically for Judaism, the Holocaust has been this absolutely foundational historical event, uh, an event of, of, of absolutely incomprehensible catastrophic cruelty and destruction. And one of the meanings of that what, event was the idea of there being no safe space on earth for the Jewish people. That, 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 that one of the aims of the Nazi Holocaust was the historical destruction, the erasure, elimination um, of, of, of Jewish people completely, you know, from human life. Um, and the idea that there was there was no defense against that. There was no there was no place to flee to. There was no one to stand up and stop that that process from happening. To such an extent that the very word genocide was invented to describe um, this event and similar events. The um, the 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 Polish Jewish uh, legal scholar Lemkin actually developed the, uh, the the legal category and social science analytic category of genocide to talk about this, um, although he did not intend it to be limited to that particular occasion. He deliberately gave it a, 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 a universal meaning. The other important aspect of the meaning of the Holocaust is that it was the outcome of really a millennium of European anti-Semitism and persecution, that this was not a um, a, a an unusual event, uh, except in its scale, but as part of relentless social discrimination, pogroms, exile, um, attacks, it 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 has a, it it existed as a continue a con on in a continuum of anti-Semitism. Now, when we think about that historical event and we think about it as being a an absolute foundational trauma for people who um, were were identified as collective victims 
Um, we must also understand that traumatic emotions continue after the original event. This is what makes them traumatic. This is just what's different between traumatic emotions and just bad emotions. Something bad happens, it feels bad, then you end up feeling better a little while later. Traumatic emotions live after the traumatic experience. And so what, we're, what we have is, is, is a lived intergenerational trauma that continues through history across generations um, of, of ongoing vulnerability. Um, and also the lived um, uh, imaginative threat of total annihilation, of, of, of the return of that historical threat of to total annihilation. This then creates, in a practical sense, in the world, a need to create a safe space to defend against those threats, a need to create a, a, a new world in which the Holocaust could not be repeated historically. And this is fundamental to the meaning of the phrase never again. This is, this is why this is such an absolutely critical phrase in thinking about um, intergenerational Holocaust trauma. Of course, there's really two different meanings of the phrase never again. And the, the one is a, is, a, is a narrow meaning and the one is a broad meaning. The one is that never again shall we as a very, very specific social group uh, be placed in this jeopardy. The other is that this shall, should never be allowed to happen to anyone in human history. But in the context of that, that intergenerational trauma, okay, the meaning of that for um, people whose identity is linked to the, to, to the attempted annihilation of the Jewish people, any threat of, of anti-Semitism functions as a trigger of that full traumatic recollection. Okay. And so in this sense, anything that is always constructed as a threat of anti-Semitism is, is in fact an invocation of Holocaust trauma. And I think this is really important to understand. Um, now, so we talk about Holocaust trauma as an emotional framing. We also are wanting to look at the intellectual framing. And here we must look at, um, at, at, at the kind of Zionist nationalist project as a type of intellectual framing of experience. Okay, now let's from the outset acknowledge that this, this was a contested project, that Zionism, which sort of conceptually came into existence before the state of Israel and was its kind of guiding conceptual model, uh, was always contested amongst Jewish people and on multiple grounds, uh, on some on ethical grounds that it was, that it, it, it was, um, uh, it, it, it was an unethical project because of the violence that it that it that entailed um, on pragmatic grounds that it that in fact the outcomes of it would be negative on religious grounds that some people felt in fact it was a heretical notion that this was that that this was going against um, the religious um, injunction to be a people who were um, among the nations. Um, and also the artic Zionism's articulation of itself was, was also heavily contested on just factual grounds. It involved uh, misrepresentations and dishonesty. Um, so even before the formation of the, the state of Israel, when um, Jewish delegations were sent to Palestine, um, the, there's, there, there's, 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 there, there's, there's a kind of a, um, a phrase that, that is attributed to their resistance to the Zionist project, um, where they said the bride is beautiful, but she's married to another man, and here the real sense that that the Zionist project was flawed um, because um, of because of the other man, which I will talk about later. But the idea of the Zionist project is the idea of the safe space on earth for the Jewish people, the idea of the place. The place that, that, that whose absence allowed the Holocaust to happen, that this will be the place where um, that degree of persecution, that degree of violence um, could not happen, and the place that would have the ability to prevent it happening elsewhere, even. Okay. Um, because then 
the state of Israel within the Zionist framing becomes the safe place on earth, the safe place in history for the Jewish people, then any attack, even a purely intellectual conceptual critique of Israel, comes to function within that explanatory system as an attack on all Jews. It comes to function as intrinsically anti-Semitic. Um, and as it does that, it also does the other work of triggering the intergenerational trauma of the Holocaust, that the critique of the Zionist project um, triggers this, this historical um, Holocaust trauma. Um, at the same time, we see that within the Zionist conceptual framing of its historical project, there's a real attempt to establish the legitimacy of the state of Israel against the Bride is, is Beautiful um, uh, version of events, which establishes the, the state of Israel as legitimate, firstly, on theological grounds. It is the promised land of the Jewish people. That's it. Um, uh, and that that's a hard to contest because either you assent to, you, you know, the tenets of the religion or you don't. Secondly, um, a kind of a political thing that it was given, it was given to the Jewish people by the relevant authorities, by Europe, by, by the UK. And, and there the Balfour Declaration is the kind of critical kind of legal document. And then later the recognition of, of uh, and contested recognition of the state of, of Israel in the United Nations. Thirdly, there's this idea that the state of Israel exists as a as a kind of just compensation for the Holocaust. So even if it's even if its history information is somewhat problematic, um, it is is it it is deserved as a, com a compensation for the atrocities of the Holocaust. But one of the most important conceptual things underneath all of these, uh, and really at the heart of the Zionist framing is the idea of Israel as a land without people for people without a land. And this, this was a central phrase in the marketing of Zionism, that, um, that, that, that this, the, the displaced Jewish people were, were, were being given this empty space that they could turn into their safe space on earth. Um, but the question, of course, that is then raised is what did that safety cost? And here the the um, the issue of the of the colonial nature of the Zionist project. And it's interesting because nowadays um, within Zionist circles, it's popular to 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 to, to deny that it is historical. Uh, it is historically a colonial project. This was not the case um, for, for early and founding Zionists. Um, people like Theodor Herzl were very, very explicit that it was a, a colonial project. They, they were corresponding with Cecil John Rhodes and the other you know, notorious uh, uh, colonizers. Um, but, but, but interesting, if we, if we even look at the, 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 the first generation founders, of 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 uh, of of the Israeli state, um, and here let you know we let's go straight to the words of David Ben Gurion, literally the founding prime minister of Israel, and I'll quote: "Let us not ignore the truth amongst ourselves. Politically, we are the aggressors. They defend themselves. The country is theirs because they inhabit it. Whereas we want to come here and settle down, and in their view, we want to take their country away from them." Now that's a very different uh, political articulation to what one typically sees currently in terms of um, the justification of the Zionist project. So ben Gurion goes on and he says, if I were an Arab leader, I would never sign an agreement with Israel. It is normal. We have taken their country. It is true that God promised it to us, but how could that interest them? Our God is not theirs. Yes, there's been anti-Semitism, the Nazis, Auschwitz, but was that their fault? They see but one thing, we have come and we have stolen their country. Why would they accept that? Now, this is really interesting because this is, this is a radical admission of the, 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 the violent and violating foundation of the Zionist project. Interestingly, though, Ben-Gurion's reaction to this was not 
caution and say, well, let's rethink this. Let, 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 let's think about the Zionist project um, in a way that might be possible without this violence. On the contrary, he, 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 he gave these explanations as reasons to double down on the violence, as reasons why they, they should necessarily be a total ethnic cleansing of Palestine, because it would simply be unreasonable to assume that Palestinian people would 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 ever come to accept the um, occupation of their land, and this is really kind of a founding idea of um, of of um, colonialism that is that 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 is inside um, the sense of of the right to take um, someone else's land, because it, although here already Ben Gurion is is acknowledging the the sense of loss to the Palestinian people. Um, the foundational to colonialism, much more radical idea, um, expressed through the idea of, of terra nullius, um, the idea of the empty land, that, um, that when colonizers arrive in a particular place, when Columbus, you know, quote unquote, discovers America or Captain Cook using this very phrase, um, claims uh, Australia for the British crown, um, uh, the idea that indigenous people are not really people, and thus, even though they are visibly present, the land is conceptually, from a colonial point of view, empty, and is okay for the, the colonizers to take it as their own. Um, okay, so now we have, based on that, based on that, 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 conceptual framing of the founding of the state of Israel, we have then the sustained nationalist narrative, okay? Um, and, a, and, and this giving a version of history which, which has impacts for the legitimation of violence. So a version of history that, that, that legitimates certain kinds of violence. This, the version of history then has, is built on the idea that persecuted Jewish people arrived in the empty land that was promised to them. What happened then? They were attacked. They were attacked by surrounding forces. Uh, not, not, um, they, they were resisted by the people who were living on the land and they were res resisted um, at a certain critical point by people in um, surrounding countries. Because in the, in the colonial framing of it, the land was empty and the, the land was was justifiably theirs. Therefore, these attacks must necessarily logically be interpreted as unprovoked and malicious. And this is absolutely the core of the Zionist interpretation of, of, of the conflict. Not only are these attacks then unprovoked and malicious, it necessarily follows that they must be like the other attacks and persecution that Jewish people have experienced they must be driven by anti-Semitism, okay? So the, so the justificatory narrative of the colonization creates the idea of innocent victim being maliciously attacked, which extends to the idea that this attack must be part of a, 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 a gr the, the great history of anti-Semitism, the great history of the hatred of Jewish people. Anti-Semitism then in the, in, in, in the context of historical trauma is always ultimately uh, genocidal, okay? Um, it, it always presents an existential threat to the viability of the, um, the existence of the Jewish people. And so to, in reaction to it, they need to completely annihilate their enemies, okay? That, 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 that the, the, these, 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 malicious forces that are that are attacking them have to be completely erased in a weird kind of um rep, almost repetition compulsion of the of the holocaust impulse to destroy um the jewish people because their enemies have to, to be destroyed anyone who obstructs that annihilation is also part of the anti-semitic process is also an enemy is also a direct threat, is also someone who triggers this kind of Holocaust trauma 
and becomes a an existential threat. And that extends not to just to people who might act in act, uh, engage in acts of military resistance, but but even articulation of seemingly neutral things like any articulation of the human rights of Palestinians. Okay, so any criticism is then plugged into this post-traumatic Zionist ideology of persecution. So simply saying, stop bombing the children, simply saying free Palestine, simply saying stop the genocide becomes within this emotional conceptual framing becomes a potentially annihilatory by definition anti-Semitic threat um, that needs to be opposed at all costs and using any means necessary. On the other hand, in direct opposition to that particular trauma and ideological framing, we have a competing trauma and ideological framing. Uh, and this is the global experience of colonial trauma. For most of the world, the past few centuries have been the experience of colonization, disposition of the land and resources, total dehumanization, slavery, ethnic cleansing, and multiple and recurring genocide across the colonized world. Um, this then becomes the core foundational historical trauma that shapes the uh, intergenerational trauma of, um, of uh, people outside the West. Um, and this also then shapes the understanding that the, the very reason that Western powers uh, gave Palestine, as opposed to, say, giving part of Germany, where most of the Ashkenazi Jews originated from at that point and were ethnically cleansed from in the Holocaust, um, that this is precisely because of the colonial negation of non-Western people. The idea of a you know, land without a people for people of outer land, that is, that is the genocidal colonial impulse to occupy and dispossess people of their land because you don't even see them as as um, human subjects with human rights. This process of colonization, this long hundreds of years of colonization was always brutally, murderously violent from the outset. Um, and the specific colonization of Israel was brutally, murderously violent. And um, even in the lead up to the actual formation of the state of Israel, settler terrorist groups, Zionist terrorist groups, Hachanah, Ergen, Lehi, um, were murdering thousands of Palestinians. Um, and they weren't just murdering them because they wanted the 15,000 Palestinians dead. In fact, they weren't just murdering Palestinians. There was a split in the Zionist terrorist groups, those who were also murdering the British um, administra administrators. Um, but the point of these mass murders, the point of burning down people's houses, driving them out of their towns, um, was to create terror. It was, it was in the most proper literal sense terrorism. It was meant to create a pervasive social in, environment of terror to drive Palestinians off their land, to drive them into exile. Um, and to begin the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. And in that, it was highly successful that most Palestinians were driven out of um, uh, Palestine by the incredible violence of the Nakba, by, the, by, by this, this murderous terrorism, both of these uh, self-styled Zionist um, terrorist groups, but also then by the militia of the Zionist state. Um, so the founding trauma for people out, uh, people of the, the the kind of global south is 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 is, is colonization and, and but specifically for people of palestine the founding trauma is 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 this um the violence of the nakba but it's not just a founding trauma this is one of the big differences from it the holocaust ultimately ended and the Nazis were historically defeated. And there was a total shift in the balance of power. The Nakba 
what it is is an ongoing state. It is an ongoing state through the creation of a brutal apartheid um, uh, social regime, well documented, formally recognized by the United Nations, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, Israeli NGOs like Yeshdin and Bitzalem, um, that that this system uh, of human rights abuses um, that that was continuous and endemic in its denial of human rights and its imposition of, of, of continuous historical trauma on the Palestinian people. Within this, um, the, the purported solutions that the West uh, every now and again would, 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 would try and offer the, of, the, of the two-state solution was, was very deliberately and specifically sabotaged by Israel, despite their accounts to the contrary. Um, the right of the exiled Palestinians to return was never granted. The full autonomy of a Palestinian state with its, with its own governance, control of its own borders, control of its own military, that was never granted. And, um, and so, so, so the, the possibility of, a, of, of autonomy and uh, the ability for sustained historical protection of human rights ha has not been put on the table. Um, not only that, but within this kind of situation and under international law, decolonial resistance is recognized. It is a recognized right that if a, if a colonized power is dispossessing you of your resources and human rights, you, that, that there's not only a moral, but a legal provision for you to resist that using uh, the retaliatory violence to 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 that colonial violence. Furthermore, specifically on this question of the current situation in Gaza, which is which is uh, often attributed simply to um, the activities of Hamas. Hamas uh, is is in fact a post traumatic organization. When you look at the the history of the organization, it was specifically founded by several people who, when they were children, had witnessed mass atrocities at the hands of the Israeli army, specifically that they, they, they had witnessed the men of their communities being rounded up and, and, and massacred, like all of them murdered. And the only reason they escaped is because they were too young to be considered men, that these were, these were young boys witnessing the the um, the killing of of everyone in the communities, which firstly created a, a sort of foundational core trauma, and that trauma then was articulated as a commitment to a decolonial struggle and the commitment to a violent decolonial struggle, and a and a framing of the idea that the use of violence in that decolonial struggle was appropriate because it would counter the much greater violence that was being exercised against their people. Looking at these two foundational historical traumas and these two articulations of the meaning of the acts of violence, we can see that the problem is that they are, um, that, that they are incompatible, is that they, um, that they, they just don't don't have any common ground with each other. There, 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 there just isn't enough consensual middle space to articulate a shared meaning. Um, but both of them are structurally similar in some ways. Both narratives are built on a, on a foundational trauma. Both of them are elaborated in ways that give different meanings to historical and contemporary events. Both of them lead to identifying, justifying, and necessitating certain acts of violence as a result of that trauma and that framing. The primary difference between them, and the thing that they really is marked between them, is the extent to which they, they are built on the erasure of uh, social and historical reality. That the one one involves a fundamental denial of events that happened, and in that sense, um, the the Zionist project must have as its non-negotiable founding conceptual principle um, this this denial of its own co coloniality, the denial of the fact that it was based on violence and terror, the denial of 
both the 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 foundational significance of the terror of the and violence of the Nakba and the denial of the continuing um system uh the continuing um at, at creation of the 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 impossibility of human life in Gaza through the system of uh, um apartheid divisions through the system of violent control through the system of control of resources um so what we also seeing is not just that we are seeing this kind of division uh, globally between the west and the rest between the west and the global south and and what i'm arguing for is that perhaps one of the ways of understanding this division because it doesn't only apply to the to the current um, palestine situation it applies much more widely uh, to 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 geopolitics and human suffering is that the west takes as foundational the holocaust um, as the prototype of trauma the global south on the contrary takes colonialism and colonial violence as its foundational trauma and that leads to entirely different standpoints with which to understand a whole lot of things a whole lot of uh forms of contemporary uh exploitation um justifications for emergent post-colonial governments uh, there, there, there's so many things that I could give other talks on that are linked to 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 these differing um primary traumas at the same time we are seeing the conceptual articulation of those traumas different that they, we uh, I already sort of mentioned the Gen Z framing of it which is basically through the the, the Western traditional media institutions the traditional um you know uh, newspapers and television that have always understood this uh from the um Zionist standpoint from the Holocaust trauma standpoint from the Western imperialist standpoint and have always explained it in terms of that Zionist ideology of Jewish people being maliciously attacked by a purported set of Jew hating terrorist enemies um in contrast to that, the younger generation who are getting immediate information from their news feeds, from citizen journalists, from the, 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 the live reporting, the tweeting and the Instagramming and the TikToking of people showing what their daily lives on the ground in Gaza are like. This, 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 this creates an utterly different intellectual framing that cannot be... Um, accommodated within the traditional western view and so we we start seeing a rupture and a sense that that of of that the his that of having been gaslit by that that zionist ideological standpoint of the western press and and experiencing a much more immediate much more emotionally historically intellectually immediate experience of 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 the human catastrophe that is unfolding day to day and this is creating a really interesting um, and serious situation where the cultural capital underpinning Zionism in the West is faltering, notwithstanding the massive religious, ideological, military and economic interests um, supporting it, that there is this kind of breakdown which we're seeing manifesting in these protests, in these encampments, but also in the reactions to them. Um, here is where i really get to my conclusion okay about atrocity not being its own explanation and to say that what i want us to do now is to reflect on a general theoretical framing of saying what intellectual tools might be useful at this moment to talk about this crisis okay um and a couple of of things and i'm going to talk quite generally because we don't have time now to go into the specifics i will follow this up in the future in more detail okay firstly as a as a conceptual tactic to move away from the individualization and pathologization of violence this idea of reducing violence to pathological individuals this particular psychopath that that deranged animalistic terrorist organization this is the, 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 this is absolutely unhelpful all this really is is a articulation of incomprehension and uh, incapacity for 
any kind of uh, identification into the experience of the perpetrators of violence. Instead of that, what I'm arguing for is that we identify the underlying uh, emotional structure um, that uh, behind um, these forms of conflict. Uh, specifically, I've argued for ad ad identifying an underlying traumatic structure. At the same time, that, that underlying emotional structure must be understood in terms of the narrative structures and the meanings that emerge. And that those meanings may be politically manipulated, they may be cynically um, deployed, they may involve erasure of the simple facts of history, they may involve erasure of human experience, but, but that they have an identifiable conceptual structure that can be looked at as a system. And rather than simply um, going after the logical incoherence or the poor historical factual support for a particular claim, it's more important to understand the discursive system as a system that coheres and produces intelligibility. Um, and to think about that um, as a way of understanding the, um, the, the, the way in which violence replicates itself. Um, within that, Understanding those those ideological systems, understanding that underlying emotional structure, we, we must think about that in terms of the way in which it produces identities and identifications. It, it produces ways of living in the world. It produces ways of feeling about things, way, way, ways of feeling about um, the events we see in the news, ways of thinking about what is happening when someone says something or does something or puts a tent on a university lawn or drops a bomb on a residential dwelling. Um, we need to take seriously within these identities and identifications the lived experience of threat, even if it seems unreasonable, even if it seems insane, even if it seems radically at odds with reality, it's still worth inquiring into its constitution um, and to say, how has this come into being? Um, doing that, applying these conceptual tools, which I very briefly tried to sketch, then allows us to reframe interventions around those understandings, not around the, uh, uh, the simple refutation of empirical claims, not around simply trying to um, master up superior firepower to achieve a particular political end game, but to change the, uh, the systems of meanings. And, and as an academic, this is particularly important for me that the whole process, that the, the whole process of, of identifying, re reflecting on and creating systems of meaning seems to be much more effective um, than people give it credit for. It, I mean, within um, saying that, I mean, one mustn't fantasize that words stop tanks, that, 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 that analysis stops drones falling on people's homes. Um, but, it, but it addresses the systems that engender and bring into being and sustain the use of those bombs, the use of, of, of those military weapons. And so it is worth and go, going into that to, to understand the, um, the, the, the ways in which it, it's systems of feeling and systems of thought that, 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 that are the conditions of possibility for acts of violence, both acts of oppressive violence and acts of violent resistance. Um, and I'm going to leave it at that to, um, today then, and I will explore this further um, in other ways in the future. Thank <laughs> you.
تحكي بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم برافو عليكي هيك حافظة ايش يا عمري Oh, my God.